Hey guys, it's Tyler and Alex from ZipGrow and we're from the research team and we've compiled a bunch of questions from our YouTube channels and emailed questions in and made a Q&A video. We wanna answer some of the common questions we uh, come across um, about aquaponics, hydroponics and growing vertically. Well, Tyler, the first question that we have here are, what are some of the functions of an air stone and pump in a zip garden? Yeah, for sure. So typically in a hydroponic system, you'll use an aeration stone or some form of aeration um, to add oxygen to the water. This aerates the water, increases dissolved oxygen, with, which really helps with nutrient uptake of the plant. It also helps maintain low water temperatures by moving airflow through the, uh, the water and also a little bit of turbulence in the water to help keep your fertilizers mixed um, and any other additives in your system well uh, you know, distributed within the water in the solution. Another question here is, if your pH is too high, how can you bring it down? And what are some of the safe acids that uh, you can use to make the pH go down? Yeah, for sure. So typically, uh, if your pH is too high, you're reading that on your pH meter, you will use some form of an acid to bring that pH down. There's a bunch of different options to do this. Um, typically, the most common one you'd use in a, both a commercial and a hobby setting is phosphoric acid. This is uh, widely available through hydroponic suppliers. It's usually the number one go-to to, because it's so stable, it's so consistent, um, and it's so efficient at bringing the pH down in a, um, you know, a stable manner. Uh, if you don't want to use phosphoric acid because it's you know, corrosive or, or could be dangerous in a high concentration, some folks will use citric acid, and there are some biological methods as well, but phosphoric acid is typically our go-to. Um, the only dangers with it really is that it is corrosive, um, so you want to be careful with your handling it. But from a food safety perspective, it is very safe. Okay, another question here we have, is weight measured by dry weight or fresh weight? With regards to that, I think it's really important to understand what your uh, consumer wants or who you're selling to. Uh, if they want something that is dried, for example, maybe some dried herbs, you would be quoting them in dried weight. Um, but for the majority of the part, or the majority of the situation, we like to use wet weights. That's just usually how produce is handled. So you have fresh heads of lettuce, fresh herbs, anything like that. Another question we have here is how do we know that the nutrient level is decreased and when do we need to add nutrients and also kind of what is the time interval between that? With regards to that, I would always say uh, there's a feeding schedule online and you would reference that based off of uh, your EC meter. Uh, if you ever see that, uh, you know, one week that you're extremely low in your EC, if that's part of the crop cycle, you can always add some more nutrients to it. If you notice that you're getting a, some type of pH drift, I usually say if it's a pH drift of more than 0.3, uh, I would always recommend a complete reservoir swap, and then that gives you the chance to just replenish the nutrients and gives you a great fresh start to that. Another question that we have here is, how do you fight mold and seedling damping off in a moist environment? Um, so typically uh, when you're growing seedlings, uh, it's really important to make sure you um, allow for enough of a dry back on the plug. Um, seedlings like to be wet, uh, seeds like to be wet to germinate, um, however, between irrigation events, you do want to allow a small amount of dry back just to help the, you know, encourage uh, healthy root development um, and to kill off any of those pathogens in your system. Um, you can also discourage damping off and, uh, you know, mold and algae in your system by increasing airflow across your seedlings. So just a gentle airflow is very important when you're uh, propagating seedlings. Um, and also there's other methods. So things like keeping clean and disinfected water, um, as well as there are biological additives you can use to deter damping off if you're gonna do a commercial system as well. Another question we have that's kind of related to, uh, I guess, mold and algae buildup. Is there an ever an algae buildup with uh, clay pebbles? I'm currently using some pumice stones and have an issue with some algae buildup. Does clay work better? With regards to that, I think if you're having some type of uh, algae issue, you'll have that algae issue to, like regardless of the medium that you're using. So some ways that you can use to prevent that is like what Tyler was mentioning, having proper, prop, having proper airflow, uh, making sure that uh, you have uh, clean water, that you're thoroughly cleaning between events. Um, and also there are some type of additives uh, that we use. You can use either some hydrogen peroxide. We also use a commercial product called Clearline uh, and that just helps keep the water clean and prevents any type of uh, algae growth. Another question here is how do you detect pests quickly? And what do you recommend to avoid getting them in the first place? So IPM is uh, the core of almost any commercial uh, grow operation. Uh, you're always making a bug hotel. So I've never seen a grow where there hasn't been some type of pest issue. They just always love it, no matter how diligent you are. So my number one recommendation for that would be proper scouting. Is 
important to create a routine where you are doing these daily or weekly walkthroughs, checking uh, these yellow sticky trap cards for pest pressures, looking for any signs of plant deficiencies or bug damage, okay? And then once you detect them, that is your time to act. You want to act as soon as possible, uh, and we use uh, biologicals. And what biologicals are is that they're just specialty insects that are bred for the specific pests that you have, uh, and then that way we can keep a pesticide-free environment. How important is it to use a reverse osmosis system in a, in a commercial farm? On a commercial setting, I would say that it is absolutely vital. Uh, Tyler and I run into these uh, problems quite a fair bit where uh, people will believe that their city or their tap water is adequate enough for a farm. Uh, you know, while it might be safe for humans to drink and safe to water your plants with, when you're dealing in uh, these commercial operations, the hmm. <laughs> when you're dealing with these commercial operations, it's really hard to dial in the adequate nutrient amount. Uh, also, when you're using city or tap water, sometimes it's not as stable. So when you're adding these nutrients to it, you'll get these pH swings, and that'll just negatively impact your crop. Given the uh, price point of what an RO system is, which is would be, I would say, like under a thousand dollars a year in all of your filters and membranes. It is quite an insignificant cost and has some very serious implications if you're not uh, replacing them routinely. All right, Tyler, we have a question about aquaponics here. Are there any monitoring, monitoring tools available for aeration devices that would help keep dissolved oxygen at safe levels for fish? Yeah, for sure. So typically in an aquaponic system, if you're using mechanical aeration, it's unlikely you're going to hit dissolved oxygen levels that are too high. Uh, that being said, once you include, um, you know, elevated levels of DO through chemical means or other means, um, you do want to monitor this. Um, and especially normally monitoring the minimum level of DO required to keep your fish healthy. Uh, companies such as Milwaukee have probes uh, that you can put in the water that measure the DO as a part per million. Um, so these are these are pretty inexpensive, pretty reasonable to purchase for your system uh, for monitoring the DO levels. Um, but typically, as long as you have adequate aeration in your system and you're balancing your system properly, this isn't something that you need to monitor, monitor regularly. If you do want to go above and beyond, there are DO stat systems. So a company we know, uh, such as Biotherm Solutions, offers a DO stat that will actually turn on and off systems based on the DO level. And we're on to the second page now. <laughs> How far should lights be from seedlings? I think that's uh, a bit more dependent on the type of light that you're using. If you're using a, a T5 or an LED T5 equivalent, I would say approximately six to eight inches away from the seedlings, you're looking to have around uh, 150 to 300 uh, PPFD to just make sure that they're not uh, getting leggy or anything like that. If you're unsure, you don't have uh, any type of meter, just keep an eye on them. Are they starting to stretch out? Are they stunted and very compact? Uh, the plants can tell you a lot without uh, the use of some meters. So just keep an eye on it, keep notes, and then always refer back to them. And you can always just adjust and play around to see what works best. So what are some of the best crops that can be grown in a zip garden? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, in the zip grow system, really the question is what can't be grown. And uh, so far we normally ran into a crop that cannot be grown hydroponically or cannot be grown vertically. Um, and what I mean by that is that really it comes down to crop architecture uh, or crop structure. Um, most crops can be grown hydroponically with a little bit of adjustment. Uh, we've grown some pretty strange crops, everything from aloe and jade trees, succulent species that typically don't do well in hydroponics have actually flourished in the zip grow system all the way to fruiting crops such as strawberries, peppers, and tomatoes. But what I mean by crop architecture is the size and structure of the crop in the system. So, um, you know, you grow something like a tomato, it can quite often grow so large that it falls out of the tower, or it's just not economically feasible to be growing vertically or indoors under LED lights. Um, same with a crop such as aloe, you know, you really gotta make sure it's economically feasible to be growing a crop as long as aloe takes to grow in a vertical system. But from a, um, you know, a limitation sense, you really can grow almost any crop hydroponically and almost any crop in a zip grow system. We haven't really run into anything that doesn't grow with the right environmental conditions and uh, you know, irrigation events. So, so what about some uh, rooting crops, for example? How well do they perform in that? Yeah, for sure. So um, crops such as radishes, carrots, potatoes can be grown hydroponically. That is maybe one of the limitations of a zip grow system. They will grow, but 
uh, this can significantly decrease the lifespan of your matrix media. Um, and what I mean by that is that they'll root into the system, but removing those crops from the media uh, really can, you know, yeah, decrease that lifespan. It's really hard on the media and um, kind of takes away from the point of having a reusable media. Um, so maybe another system would be more better suited for that kind of a crop. And we have it a few crops such as like fennel uh, that are really heavy rooters. They grow really well in the system, but uh, you know, the roots are very hard on the matrix media. Um, so, you know, again, coming back to the labor of cleaning that media out and being economically feasible, it just doesn't make sense. You can grow a healthy crop. It just sometimes need to weigh out the cost benefit of doing that. Yeah, and I just want to add to that, uh, you know, if you're just doing this for fun or as a hobby, um, there's things like the aloe vera or some of the cool fruiting crops or even some flowers that you can grow that they don't make commercial sense, but they look phenomenal. They're fun to play around with. Um, and that's, uh, I guess, one of the advantages of our hobby systems is that, like Tyler was mentioning, you can grow almost anything in them. It's made to be played with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One of our last questions here are, what are the best type of nutrients for the zip systems? Um, with regards to that, I, I would like to just split it off into both, uh, I guess, a commercial size and a hobby size. Uh, on a commercial scale, most people who are growing hydroponically, they use salt-based nutrients. And what that means is you're just getting the raw salts of the nutrients, you're mixing them yourselves into water, dissolving them. The reason for that is that it's just the most economical way to do it. You're not shipping, you know, tons of water around in your nutrient solutions, things like that. So on the commercial setting, we most often see some type of salt-based nutrients. On the hobby side though, I feel that that's a little bit too much for your beginner, or even intermediate grower. Uh, I would recommend some type of synthetic or organic-based nutrients that are fairly stable, that you don't need to play around with them too much, and they're kind of set and forget. So uh, in our zip gardens, for example, we have some nutrients that you can just add to the tower when you get it, and uh, it's kind of set and forget. All right, as uh, usual guys, thanks so much for watching. We hope we could answer some great questions for you guys and uh, feel free to ask as many questions as you want in the comment section and we'll do more of these videos moving forward. Um, as usual, like, comment, subscribe and it was a pleasure uh, answering the questions for you today. Thanks. See ya.